Welcome everyone to the Hoover Institution Workshop on using text as data in policy analysis. My name is Stephen Davis. I organize the workshop with Justin Grimmer. Um, today we're delighted to be joined by Francesco Giavazzi, um, Felix Eaglehout, Gaia Ribera, and Giacomo Lemely. Um, they're going to be talking about their work, terrorist attacks, cultural incidents, and the vote for radical parties, analyzing text from Twitter. Now, I just have to, they're, they're all connected to Bocconi University as either fac, cur, faculty members or, or former students. I do want to mention um, um, Francesco is a busy guy, and he's particularly busy at the moment because he's currently serving as economic advisor to the Italian government which is facing a possible general strike this Friday, he may get called away for some insightful advice at any moment. And it doesn't mean he's lost interest in the workshop. So uh, please excuse him if he does have to step away for a bit. Uh, Giacomo is gonna uh, present uh, the uh, paper. Um, during, the, uh, during his prepared remarks, if you have clarifying questions, please put them in the chat box. And then Justin, or Justin and I uh, will decide whether or not to uh, interject them into the discussion. After uh, Giacomo finishes his prepared remarks, we'll open the floor um, for questions and discussions. Okay, And at that point, you can use the chat box or the raise hand function as you wish. This workshop will run about 75 minutes and is recorded. Um, we will then switch to a short unrecorded session for those of you who uh, wish to stick around. Okay, so without further ado, Giacomo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the, organizer, uh, to the organizers of this workshop for inviting us. It's really great to be here. So this paper uh, is a joint work, uh, as Steve just mentioned, with uh, Francesco, Felix, uh, and Gaia. And uh, this paper really starts from the observation of a few facts. So the first one is the surge of jihadist attacks um, against civilian targets across Western European countries in the last years. Um, and uh, the second one is the concurrent immigration wave that also affected many European countries in the same period with the flows of refugees and immigrants mostly coming from war-ridden areas in the Middle East. And uh, finally, uh, the phenomenon of the electoral success of the radical right across Western European countries. So radical right parties, usually run on anti-immigration agendas. They are culturally conservative in the sense that uh, they claim to protect uh, national culture and traditions against uh, the changes brought about by globalization, but also, and especially so in the context of the surge of terrorist attacks, uh, they offer a national security rationale uh, for their anti-immigration stances. So this uh, raises a question with, that is uh, whether there are security threats uh, behind at least part uh, of the success of radical right uh, in the last few years. So in this paper, what we do is we formulate a hypothesis, which is uh, we hypothesize terrorist attacks as well as crime events, uh, which are associated with specific groups or cultures, may induce a perception of threat uh, in the public opinion. And this uh, may affect people's attitudes uh, towards these groups uh, by aligning uh, those attitudes uh, with uh, those proposed uh, by radical right parties. And so what we do in this paper is to test this hypothesis using uh, Twitter data from Germany over the period 2015-2017. So we choose Germany First of all, because it was one of the epicenters of the refugee crisis around that period, but also because it's a case of relative success of radical right party uh, parties with uh, um, a radical right party alternative for Germany, which started as a relatively marginal party, mostly concerned 
with uh, economic issues and criticisms to the European Union financial architecture, and then transition to being uh, um, um, a real radical right party proposing strong anti-immigration uh, policies. Um, so what we do in practice is uh, we build a large sample of German Twitter users around 178,000, which corresponds to roughly 10.4 million. We geolocate those accounts at the electoral constituency level with a novel procedure that we designed for this project. And I'm gonna detail in a few minutes how this works, but just to give you an intuition, it relies on a mix of hand coding and analysis of followers networks. Then, we measure similarity between the language used on Twitter by German users and that used by AFD and other parties. Then we use the exogenous timing of terrorist attacks and a criminal event that I'm going to also talk about later to identify and estimate the shifts in language similarity between constituencies and parties, which we argue are attributed to changes in attitudes of users. In order to provide further evidence in favor of our hypothesis, we also use a topic model and we run sentiment. Finally, we study the correlation of these changes in language similarity with changes in vote shares for parties between the federal elections of 2013 and 2017. So in terms of where this paper stands, we, uh, we believe this paper stands at the intersection of several strands of literature. First and foremost, uh, we build uh, on a pretty well-established literature on the political effects of terrorism. So there is a body of recent papers that uh, studies how terrorist attacks increase, increase concerns about immigration and minorities and or security fears, depending uh, on, the, on the study. And uh, I'm gonna say in a few minutes how we believe uh, um, we can advance on this literature, which mostly relies on survey data. There are also papers that look at the support um, at the effects of terrorist attacks or their threat on support for right-wing parties and political polarization. And there are also studies that look at the effect of terrorism on political participation. We also build uh, on a literature on uh, crime and discrimination, which finds that uh, exposure to crimes, uh, both uh, in geographic terms or in terms of uh, exposure to news in the media lead to discriminatory behavior uh, against the minorities that are perceived as being connected to criminal behavior or, uh, um, or the effect, its effect on a radical right. We also build on a recent literature on uh, social media and discrimination, especially recent papers that show how discriminatory language on social media translates into discriminatory behavior offline. So in the, in the real world, let's say. And finally, we connect more broadly to the literature on the drivers of radical right voting, and especially on the part of that literature which focuses on cultural explanations. So the main contribution of our work relative to this uh, um, standing body of work, we believe uh, lies in the fact that we use Twitter data. So Twitter data allow us to infer variation in attitudes from changes in language. We think that this is an improvement over survey data because uh, Twitter data are available in real time and also they are less, uh, um, they suffer less from well-known problems with survey research, such as social desirability bias. Of course, this comes uh, with so at some cost, uh, which is included in the word infer, namely that one has to rule out alternative explanations. In addition, we believe an important contribution 
lies in the fact that we provide a novel methodology for matching Twitter accounts to geographic units. This is a long-standing uh, issue in social media research, which uh, um, and to which uh, social scientists have tried uh, um, to propose solutions. Um, so we propose our own solution to this issue. And uh, to provide an overview of the findings, uh, we find that following an attack, um, there is an increase in similarity between tweets produced by German constituencies and those produced uh, by AFD. On, and uh, at the same time, there is a decrease in similarity between tweets produced by German constituencies and those produced uh, by the main left wing party. And uh, when we try to unpack uh, this uh, finding a bit, uh, we find uh, an increase uh, in the share of tweets produced by German users that mention Islam and immigration, which are the two topics uh, that A AFD tweets about uh, the most. And uh, at the same time, uh, we document uh, a decrease uh, in the sentiment of those tweets. So people not only tweet more about Islam and immigration, but they also do that with a more negatively charged uh, language. Finally, um, we show that uh, shifts in language similarity correlates uh, with changes in vote shares uh, from one election to the next. I, I, I'm gonna now uh, talk about uh, our strategy to build uh, a sample of uh, geolocated Twitter use. So the first step of our approach is to sample large towns in electoral constituencies in Germany. So we sample slightly less than 500 towns across electoral constituencies. Then for each of these towns, we go to the Twitter search bar and we manually identify and collect what we call landmark Twitter accounts for each town. So landmark Twitter accounts are accounts that are very local and uh, which are most likely to be followed by people who live uh, in the very town where the landmarks are located or in the immediate surroundings. So these are, for instance, police stations, town halls, uh, the fire that, uh, or very local shops. What do not qualify as landmark, as valid landmark accounts for us are accounts that are likely to have a broader geographic reach. So for instance, uh, professional sport teams, uh, local, media house, local media outlets, uh, um, or even things like big shopping centers, because uh, those type of landmarks are likely to be followed um, by, uh, are likely to have, uh, an, let's say, an audience of followers, uh, which is broader uh, in geographic terms. So this procedure gives us uh, more than 5,000 uh, landmark accounts. Then the next step uh, is to retrieve uh, all the followers uh, of uh, every landmark, which gives us uh, more than uh, 825,000 accounts. Then uh, in order to match uh, those accounts uh, to electoral constituencies, uh, we implement uh, a sample restriction. In particular, we match uh, a user account to an electoral constituency if that account follows at least three landmarks located in that constituency and no landmarks located in other constituencies. So once we implement uh, this restriction, we are left with uh, 178,000 geolocated accounts. Then the next step uh, is uh, to download all the tweets uh, by the users in our sample that at this point uh, are geolocated. And this gives us about 10.4 million geolocated. So with this procedure, we are able to match uh, Twitter users uh, to 235 out of 261 German electoral constituencies. Now, of course, we don't expect uh, that this sample is representative of the voting population. So in the paper, we do a number of analysis to characterize the sample selection along three main dimensions. So the first one is at the constituency level. 
So using official statistics, we compare constituencies that are in the sample and those that are out of the sample. So those that uh, we could not find uh, Twitter users for. And we find that excluded constituencies have lower population density, lower share of people born uh, abroad, and a higher share of people over the age of 60. So this is perhaps not surprising. These are pretty rural um, constituencies where people don't use Twitter very much. On the other hand, we don't find significant differences uh, when it comes to vote for AFD in the 2013 uh, federal election, um, the share of people employed in manufacturing, uh, and uh, uh, the unemployment share. The second dimension of sample selection happens within constituency. So we do have more users and a higher volume of tweets in more, densel more densely populated cities. So this is because uh, people in cities are more likely to use Twitter, but also because uh, larger cities have more landmark accounts. So our sampling strategy in this sense tends to oversample a bit uh, users that live uh, in large cities. Finally, we look uh, at the uh, selection that happens at the user level. So clearly, we all know that, uh, you, that social media users are not representative of the voting population at large. So for our purposes, uh, we are interested in uh, knowing uh, whether our sample can be um, let's say disproportionately similar to the prototypical AFD supporter. So uh, we use a pre-trained machine learning algorithm that takes uh, basic information from the Twitter accounts and uh, predict uh, um, demographic characteristics, uh, um, including whether they are people or organizations of uh, Twitter users. And we compare those predictions with uh, official demographic statistics on AFD voters. And uh, we find that the users in our sample are, uh, um, are consistently predicted to be younger than, uh, um, than uh, supporters of AFD. So to wrap up, um, our sample is biased towards more urban and younger constituencies. Uh, towards the user that live, users that live in larger towns relative to smaller ones and uh, who are younger. Therefore, even if our sample is clearly not representative, um, it should be biased against uh, what is the prototypical supporter of the AFD as suggested by the literature on AFD voting. Therefore, we think that our estimates are more like, are most likely lower. Um, then we collect uh, all the tweets uh, of the national accounts uh, of the seven main German parties. And uh, so since uh, our argument relies on uh, the idea that uh, what parties tweet about uh, is uh, representative of their position on some uh, uh, on given issues, we run some descriptive analysis uh, first to see whether uh, the language that we see in our data by parties matches known facts about their ideology. Um, and then uh, we, we estimate uh, a topic model to find differences uh, uh, across parties uh, uh, in topics covered. So I, I don't wanna spend too much time on this given the time constraints, but this just shows that um, um, in, the, in the last years, uh, AFD transitioned from being a party mostly concerned uh, about economic issues to a party mostly concerned about immigration uh, and cultural issues. So this is essentially the difference in uh, um, the relative difference in the frequency of given words uh, um, from uh, after uh, 2015 to then uh, here we show the distribution of topics that we estimate uh, with, with our topic model across parties. And here what we see is that uh, we, identify, we identify several topics that we detail in the paper. Uh, what we 
care the most here are the topics uh, about Islam and immigration. And we see that the AFD disproportionately tweets uh, about those two topics. So they amount to roughly 35% uh, of all AFD tweets. Okay, then the next step is to represent uh, this text. So at this point, uh, the data that we have uh, have the following form. So for each day, we have a document uh, of tweets uh, for each party and uh, a document for each constituency. So this means all the text uh, in those tweets. And, uh, the, and the tweets of each constituency are, are just the tweets uh, of the users that are geolocated uh, in that constituency. Then uh, we use an unsupervised algorithm uh, called doc to vec uh, to represent uh, tweets uh, of constituencies and parties are vectors uh, in a common space. So, um, so the key information here is that the vectors that have a similar semantic meaning are represented to be flawed in this space. So at this point, uh, we, we end up with uh, a vector for each party and a vector for each constituency for each of the 752 days in our sampling period. Then um, for each couple of constituency party vectors uh, in each day, we compute similarity using cosine similarity, which is a pretty, uh, pretty familiar uh, measure of, uh, of similarity. And essentially it's the cosine of the, of the angle formed uh, by the two vectors. So if two vectors are semantically very close to each other, this will, uh, this will uh, be closer to one. So in the paper, we um, in the paper appendix we talk about uh, some validation exercises, which I'm not going to go through now. But essentially, we find that uh, textual similarity between the constituencies and parties correlates uh, with uh, vote shares uh, in elections uh, and uh, with support for parties uh, in polling surveys. Then. Uh, um, we, we use a series of events. We use uh, jihadist attacks, possibly happening outside Germany, and an important criminal event uh, that I'm going to um, talk about later. So these events uh, should, uh, um, should uh, um, have three characteristics. They should be relevant, so they should constitute shocks uh, to public opinion. They should be plausibly exogenous to local conditions. And they should be able to elicit a threat uh, from other cultures of ethnic groups or ethnic groups. So given, their, given the nature of the events that we look at, uh, the ethnic group are Muslims, uh, essentially, and the other culture is Muslim in this case. So these are the events that we look at. Uh, they are almost all terrorist attacks uh, happened in Europe uh, between 2015 and 2017. The only exception being uh, the fact uh, um, of, uh, of Cologne in, uh, in the New Year's Eve of 2015, when many women reported cases of uh, assault and sexual harassment by uh, people of uh, reported uh, North African origin. Okay, so to estimate the impact of these events in, uh, um, in uh, language similarity between constituencies and parties, we use a discontinuous growth model. This is essentially a generalized version of an interrupted time series model. So essentially, we model the similarity, the cosine similarity between constituencies and parties as a quadratic time trend, which is punctuated by several discontinuities, which correspond to our event. So for each of the 11 events that we look at, we estimate a change in the level or in the intercept of the time series. And we also allow, uh, for, uh, we also allow the, quadratic, the quadratic trend to change uh, after each event. So these pi four are our estimate of interest. So they represent the change in the intercept when an event occurs. 
And note that they are indexed by I because we model a random coefficient in order to allow for heterogeneity uh, in responses. Um, so this is just uh, a visual depiction of what uh, the discontinuous growth model does. So what we are going to measure are these uh, uh, changes here represented by the arrows. And the key takeaway here is that the counterfactual against which we are evaluating these changes is the time trend before the first event occurs. So a hypothetical time trend in absence of any event. These are the main findings. So here, the blue coefficients are the coefficients for the changes in the intercept for AFD. So here we are just plotting the fixed component of, uh, of those coefficients. And uh, what we find is that uh, after each event, uh, these changes uh, in similarity are predicted to be positive uh, and statistically significant. We also plot in red uh, the same coefficients uh, for models where the outcome variable is similarity to SPD, which is the main social democratic party in Germany. And uh, we find uh, the opposite pattern. So after each event, similarity is predicted uh, to decrease uh, in, a significant, uh, uh, in a significant way. So we do several robustness checks. The most important one uh, is the following. So our hypothesis is that these changes are due to um, changes in attitudes, uh, essentially, by the public. Okay. But clearly, the first uh, question one may have is uh, what if parties themselves uh, change their language after events in order to follow uh, what the public is talking about. In the end, we have evidence of this happening, uh, for instance, with members of Congress in the US. So what we do is uh, um, for each party, we estimate, uh, we estimate uh, cosine similarity of a vector of tweets of a given week with a vector of tweets by the same party the week before, and we run the same model on that time series. So here, what we are after are uh, these continuous changes in similarity of party to themselves after, um, after terrorist attacks. So we want, we want to see whether parties change dramatically their language after a terrorist event. And uh, for AFD, we don't find uh, such evidence. Um, for SPD, we, we do estimate uh, positive uh, coefficients, uh, which if taken at face value would imply that uh, SPD is uh, tweeting in a way that is more similar uh, to what uh, it used to do before the event although these coefficients uh, are not uh, uh, significant at conventional levels. Um, we also run additional robustness checks. Uh, we use uh, placebo events uh, where we use soccer games. Uh, we try different functional forms where we allow for autoregressive terms, uh, dynamic panel models with autocorrelated errors, and we find that uh, our results hold. Then the next stop, the next uh, part, uh, is, uh, um, is that uh, our argument uh, relies uh, on the idea that uh, increases in similarity capture attitude changes about given topics, right? But there may be alternative explanations. For instance, uh, we, may, we may be just observing salience for agenda effects. So in other words, uh, after a terrorist attack occurs, uh, that monopolizes the public debate. And so people are just tweeting all together about the same thing, which just happened to be what the EFD tweets about all the time. Or it may be that, uh, um, that just everyone in the country is talking about that, okay? So it's just uh, the, the, agenda, um, the agenda of the country has moved uh, on, that, on that direction. So, um, so to rule out these alternative explanations and to uh, provide evidence in favor of our hypothesis that these are attitude changes, we need, that, uh, we need a couple of things. First, we need 
that the frequency which we is, with which uh, some topics are discussed on Twitter by users um, differs from uh, the frequency with which those topics uh, are discussed in the media environment. And we also need that uh, users uh, also change uh, the way they talk about these topics. So our approach here is uh, um, we use our topic model and we focus on the topics of Islam and immigration. So recall that these are the two topics uh, that are most characteristics of AFD. And uh, we measure the share of tweets produced by German users that contain those topics. In addition, we retrieve all the newspaper articles published in Germany, uh, in German language, that use words from these topics using the, um, the database Activa. So we use the main we use the main uh, newspapers in Germany, but we did the same analysis with all, uh, with all outlets and the results are the same. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, we run a sentiment analysis of tweets and articles that cover Islam and immigration. And so what we do here is we have human coders code a subsample of tweets and articles and uh, rank them in a scale from very negative to very positive. And then we use a, su a supervised learning algorithm to uh, predict, uh, um, to predict uh, the sentiment also for the remaining uh, tweets uh, or articles. And so this is what we have. So here the green line is the share of tweets uh, that talk about uh, Islam or immigration. And uh, we see that, uh, so these are at the weekly level. So we see that uh, um, in the weeks uh, of events, uh, the volume of tweets uh, about these topics uh, increases. But in addition to that, we see uh, an upward uh, time trend. On the other hand, uh, the blue line is the share of newspaper articles uh, that cover those topics. And uh, while we do see some spikes uh, around uh, the dates uh, of events, uh, we also see a more general downward trend. So overall, it seems that while the media environment is talking less and less about these topics, the uh, Twitter users uh, talk about them uh, more and more. Then uh, here uh, we show the here we show in, in green the same line, so the volume of tweets with about immigration and Islam, except that now it's at the daily level. And in purple here, we are showing the sentiment of those tweets about Islam and immigration. And so we see that while the, um, while the volume of uh, those tweets increases around days of events and uh, trends upwards, uh, the sentiment of these tweets uh, goes down and also trends downwards. Um, so here, on the other hand, in light blue, we are showing as comparison uh, uh, newspaper sentiment. So the sentiment that we predicted uh, of newspaper articles about Islam and immigration. And uh, while we still see some negative spikes uh, in the proximity of event dates, uh, um, this time series, although uh, much more noisier, uh, doesn't seem to follow uh, any, any particular. Then the final thing that we ask is whether changes in language similarity between parties and Twitter users can predict voting outcomes. Here we, um, we estimate uh, an equation of this type uh, where our, um, our uh, outcome variable is the difference in vote share uh, between the federal election of 2013 and 2017 in constituency I for party P and, uh, the, um, 
and the predictor here is uh, the coefficient of uh, the um, of the of the shift uh, in the intercept after the last event uh, before the 2017 election, and uh, it's indexed by i because now we are including uh, also the random component. So here we are. Uh, using the variation in reactions to terrorist attacks and to our events to, um, to show the correlations with changes in vote uh, shares for parties. Um, so here, okay, so in this, uh, um, so the unit at this, in this analysis uh, is the constituency party. So we are pulling our parties together and uh, we show that uh, um, we show that uh, um, higher, so higher increases in similarity to those parties uh, um, after the last event are correlated with higher changes uh, in vote shares. Uh, across the Giacomo, I, I have a clarifying question. Sure. When you say the similarity shift at, at the last event, you mean the cumulative shift in that coefficient over the course of the 11 events? or literally mm -hmm. only the shift at the last event? Only the shift at the last event. And then why? why? Why is only the last event before an election relevant, the only relevant thing? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, there may be other ways uh, to look at that. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, one possible reason is that um, this is the last one that happened before the election. And so we can expect it uh, to be the, the one uh, that uh, has uh, the higher effect uh, on voting behavior because it is the most recent one. But that's assuming that these mm -hmm. attitudinal shifts have a very ephemeral effect, a very temporary effect on voting patterns. And that seems like an empirical question. I'm not sure why that would be the case, but... Mm -hmm. But it, it, I think I see. it was possible. Anyway, I'll, I'll let I you see. go on. But I, I see. No, that's that's a valid point. That's a valid point. So then, to conclude, um, we argue in this paper that terrorist attacks and crimes attributed to certain groups constitute shocks to public opinion that elicit perceptions of threat. Um, and. Uh, we document uh, that uh, these events are followed by worsening attitudes about specific ethnic groups, specifically Muslims and immigrants, in a way that is consistent with narratives proposed uh, by radical right parties. We also show that uh, ch attitude changes can be at least partially captured by changes in language similarity between uh, um, users and uh, political parties. And we show that uh, language changes relative to parties can predict the uh, votes for them. And uh, that's what I have. I think uh, I'm, I okay. th th Thank you, Giacomo. I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start off with uh, a couple questions here. Um, first on the distinction between salience and attitudes. Uh, two kind of comments slash questions. First, I'm not sure why newspapers are a good benchmark um, for the salience of an issue. Um, I don't know German newspapers that well, but in the United States, I certainly wouldn't think of the New York Times as a good barometer for the salience of issues related to terrorism and immigration because their, their coverage is too much colored by their own political sensitivities. Maybe it's different in Germany. But, the, but I think there's a more fundamental um, issue uh, that I'd like to raise about the distinction between salience and, and attitudes. Well, so what? So what, why, why this distinction? Imagine if you're at the chart you showed us, the salience measure that you associated with newspapers had perfectly tracked your attitude index. Suppose they tracked each other perfectly. I'm not sure how that would alter any of the downstream analysis or the interpretation. Um, so I think the real issue that you're trying to get at, as I understand it, is how did these terrorist attacks and the crime event that you included in Cologne, how did that shift voter attitude slash salience, whatever you want to call it, 
in a way that altered elections, election cho choices, or did it? So I, I just wanted to press you. I don't really see that that distinction is is either well made in your analysis or even important to the, the, the end result. And that the second set of things I wanted to raise is about your equation two. And I already raised one, one issue about equation two. I don't really see the logic behind restricting attention to the most recent election. But more generally, there, there's a very nice feature of the methodology you, you used to construct the right-hand side variable in equation two. And you could take the same methodology and construct other regressors that might be confounders in your current specification. For example, uh, macroeconomic developments, um, like announcements of recent unemployment data, while those are common across constituencies at any point in time, you can take exactly the same approach you did and see whether in certain constituencies in the wake of say some unemployment report, and I just use this as an example, um, there's an increased similarity or a decreased similarity between local tweets about that topic and party tweets. And if that in turn has an impact on election outcomes. So it seems to me you've just scratched the surface of this methodology that you have for generating right-hand side variables that possibly have predictive content for election outcomes and that could be confounders of what you currently stick in there. So I'll, I'll mm -hmm. stop there with those, but those are two okay. sets of issues that I, it'd be great if you and your co-authors could respond to. Okay, um, so I, I think I can, uh, I, I can quickly answer to both points. So on the first one, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's clearly a valid point. Uh, I can only say that we have already received uh, this uh, comment. So there is, uh, there is certainly a uh, merit in it. So uh, this is surely something uh, um, we should uh, think a bit about. Um, so on the second point, uh, um, so it's a very interesting suggestion. So I, I, so it's not in the presentation, but uh, in the paper we say that uh, we try to see whether uh, uh, the variation in responses, so whether uh, the variation in random coefficient uh, um, correlates uh, with uh, known uh, variables that are known to be predictors uh, of uh, radical right voting. Um, but so we don't find uh, we don't find significant correlations. Um, but uh, we should probably um, we should probably try. Uh, I mean, consider uh, what you suggested, which seems uh, very interesting. Uh, yeah. So thank you for that. Okay. Um, well, let let me turn it over to others. I I see I misspoke earlier. We don't actually have the raise hand function activated. Um, we did have a question from Jen Pan, Jen, Jen Pan, uh, Jen Pan uh, earlier that I think, uh, do, I'm sorry, do we have the capacity for Jen to pose her question um, by her, herself or do we need to, uh, I'm asking the uh, behind the scenes wizards here. Can, can we unmute Jen and let her pose her question or not? Yes, I'll allow her to. Okay, great. And then we'll let Jen pose her question. And, and then we're going to go to you after that. You're next up, Dave Annan. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, my question was regards to the sample. I was asking whether the landmark accounts are government or all government or state affiliated. And the answer was no. I'm still wondering if a large proportion are, because if that's the case, then the constituents that you're gathering are those of higher political or civic interests. And that's not necessarily a problem because these are people who are potentially more important or more likely to vote. But I think that's just the point to um, keep in mind that these are particular types who follow the police station or the town hall. Okay, um, so I think, uh, um, so I think uh, Gaia could answer better to this, uh, but I, I don't think we did this particular check uh, which may be worth doing. Guy, if you want to jump in here, feel free to do so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
No, I mean, uh, I see Jen's point. I think it is a valid if we, I, I was trying to remember, sorry, we collected the data a long time ago. So we had police stations, but we also had uh, grocery stores, uh, local theaters, uh, gyms. Uh, so probably not uh, just uh, uh, people that are uh, heavily politically involved. Okay, so I would say, yeah, people who are involved in the local life, that for sure, that must attend some uh, local uh, uh, store or gyms or whatever, but not uh, uh, just uh, some political affiliated activity. And uh, no, I just have a clarification about the, uh, why we selected the, the last uh, shift the question that Steve had before. So given the way the discontinuous growth model uh, works, what happens is that this last shift basically in a certain sense accounts for all the other events. So it is basically the difference between what we observe and what we would have observed in the absence of all the events. Okay, so we okay. take the last one right. just so it, for that to reason. Very helpful. So it is, it is essentially the cumulative effect of all 11 events. Yeah. As yeah. estimated by your model. Yeah. So it, it accounts for the fact that there were all these other uh, shocks, all these other events. Yes. And, it, and it, it, there is a related issue of, of, of whether more recent, of, more recent effect of uh, shifts do have a bigger impact. But you know, so you, I guess you could explore that as well. Dave, and on, and again, uh, do we have the capacity to let Dave pose his question? Or if not, then I'll read it. All right, well, well, I'll read Dave's question. He's got two questions. I think they're probably on the minds of, of several people in the audience. So question one is, how are German Twitter users different from, say, American Twitter users? And um, if at all, uh, how can German Twitter user, can the analysis of German Twitter users um, be uh, uh, applied to say American Twitter users? So basically a question about, you know, uh, how much can we extrapolate uh, from the analysis in this paper to uh, the settings in the United States and other countries for that matter? So if you, if you recall more details uh, about uh, German Twitter users, uh, uh, please jump in. So the thing is that uh, we, we looked a lot for uh, uh, statistics about uh, Twitter users in Germany. They are very difficult to find. So one thing that we found for sure is that uh, German seems to be much less prolific uh, Twitterers. So, um, so for instance, uh, the overwhelming majority of them don't reach uh, the the limit the limit of uh, three thousand something tweets that Twitter API poses to download all the tweets of an account. Uh, we know that uh, in the US uh, this is almost uh, this is very hardly the case. Uh, so people tend to tweet much more. Um, so this is certainly this is certainly. Yeah, I mean, in general, it seems that uh, Twitter is much more used in the US than uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, so for sure, there are fewer users that we can sample in Germany than in the US. And then there is the other issue, as Jacob was saying, that even the users who are on Twitter in Germany are uh, uh, much less prolific, so they write uh, less. Uh, that would be interesting. Uh, I don't think that we have the data to answer the question whether the fact that they don't write, that they write less means that they write more about politics or less. That uh, could be interesting uh, to, 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 to uh, study. Uh, I believe that our general sense, uh, common wisdom uh, is that in the US people uh, use Twitter to discuss uh, uh, politics much more than uh, in Europe or much more than uh, in the US, especially during the Trump administration, uh, right? So if the question is, uh, can we use uh, Twitter in the US to uh, replicate this kind of analysis? I believe the answer is uh, uh, yes, because there should be more data and uh, more discussion uh, available. 
I also think that uh, uh, the users in the US should be more representative than the, of the US population than uh, German users. So probably the biases that we have in our sample, even though we believe that they work against our results, because we uh, under sample, uh, we believe uh, if the uh, voters are probably, uh, there should be less concern about uh, the representativeness of uh, the Twitter bias in the US. I'm curious about who's tweeting before and after the events and to what extent certain super users could be driving various kinds of results. So one thing you notice in a lot of, I think, US Twitter is that a very small number of people can fire off lots of tweets. And one could imagine similar sorts of dynamics happening here where certain people get really seized by an event and, and tweet much more often. Yeah, yeah. So we have uh, done analysis to answer both questions. So the first question is, uh, are there super users? So we find uh, no. I think that Jacob at a certain point showed that uh, graph. Basically, we found that there is an increase in volume, but there is also an increase of users uh, who tweet about Islam and uh, immigration. And uh, we checked, uh, uh, we did, did analysis uh, uh, to see whether there are super uh, active users, and the answer was uh, uh, no. And the other question is, uh, who is uh, tweeting about that? Actually, we did uh, that analysis uh, too. And uh, I am recovering uh, and looking at the graph right now. So basically what we did is we took uh, the top 5% users of all the users that we have in our sample. So we got the users that uh, tweet about Islam immigration. We got to just the top 5%. And to answer your, your question, first one, uh, these top 5% tweet 17% uh, of the total Islam immigration tweets. So um, I believe that, that there is not a, a concentration issue there. And then uh, what we did for these users, uh, we looked at uh, the description, the bio that they have uh, on uh, Twitter and we classified them in seven categories, whether they are uh, AFD politicians, excluding the uh, official party county, whether they are politicians by other parties, uh, whether they are uh, media journalists, uh, users who are openly racist. You can uh, see, clearly see that from uh, their uh, uh, bio. We also read uh, the first 200 tweets that, that they post. Users who are uh, uh, clearly against racism, Muslims, and then uh, uh, all uh, the others. And basically what we um, find is that the general public posted the majority of the uh, Islam immigration uh, tweets. Okay, so it's not that there is uh, someone that uh, all the other categories, media politicians, uh, Muslims, racist, uh, not racist, they don't seem to drive the, the, the discussions. There are days where Muslims tweet a lot, and typically we find that when there was uh, the leader of the Muslim community that visited the Germany, we saw an increase in the tweet by Muslims. But overall, it is always the general public that seems to tweet uh, more, no, seems to drive the discussion. Can, can I um, ask a couple? Uh more questions or really suggestions, things things I kind of wanted to see as I looked at the paper. Um, you had an analysis of whether um, party language shifted in the wake of each of these uh, events, kind of a short-term analysis. But it would also just as a piece of um, context be useful to know whether there was some long-term shift in the composition of party language towards more or less discussion of immigration, terrorism, um, concerns about um, um, Muslims, um, just because th there, may, there may be such, there may be important shifts of that sort. Um, and it would be rather surprising given what's happened in Germany in 2015, 2016, if you didn't see some secular shift from 2013 to 2017 in what parties we're talking about. I mean, 
if they weren't shifting at all, they would just be failing to respond to you know major uh, societal events. But just uh, documenting that and doing so by party and maybe um, in incorporating the sentiment shifts as well will be a useful piece of, of background information. And maybe it's in your study already, but I didn't see it. So that, that, that's one thing. The second is, um, it would be nice, and I realize it'd be nice to just tell us in a simple summary statistic, what is the what is the decay rate, the average decay rate, in tweets about terrorism, crime, etc., uh, among Twitter users in the wake of these events. Um, you have a more sophisticated empirical model than just an AR an AR one process. I realize that, but um, as a summary statistic, you know, you've got a jump in the level that happens in the wake of these events. You allow for that in your model. And then if I understand correctly, you've got linear and quadratic trend terms. But just it would also be helpful to have a takeaway head in my number. What is the average decay rate implied by your fitted model, say over the first one week, two weeks, three weeks, and so on? Um, because as, as the model stands now, it's sufficiently rich but it's actually, it's hard for me at least to come away with what I should think about uh, as a quantitative measure of the persistence of the impact of these events on um, tweet frequency about certain topics or sentiment. So same thing about sentiment. You know, you'd, you'd like to know what the decay rate is because that would give us some insight into whether um, these attitudinal shifts are potentially very short-lived, at least as reflected in uh, tweets, or they're quite persistent. Thank you. I, I think, I think uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I, I take it more as a suggestion. Uh, yeah. So it's- uh, If you have an off-the-cuff answer, that'd be great, but it's really a suggestion for the next draft. Yeah, okay. But so, so uh, what we did is analysis. So we didn't include it in the paper because uh, uh, there is this limit and we are already over the limit. But we did a, a analysis of uh, the log odds of using words, uh, the, the words that parties use. So uh, Giacomo showed uh, some of them that was before and after uh, basically if they changed uh, from uh, uh, anti-euro to anti-immigrants uh, but we did that also for all the other parties uh, and uh, i mean we have the results uh, that's just uh, we don't know where to put the in there in the, but it would, I, I agree that uh, that uh, it would be extremely interesting uh, just to uh, have a probably a paper on the discussion on the language uh, how the parties uh, change their positioning uh, over time uh, and for the decay rate, uh, yeah, I agree with Jacob. It's a very nice uh, suggestion. We checked whether the time series are stationary. So we found that the uh, time series of uh, um, the sentiment is uh, not stationary and uh, of a newspaper, so the sentiment is, uh, and uh, uh, no, I don't remember. Uh, but yeah, we don't have the average decay rate. That could be an interesting uh, measure. Have thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, Timothy. Um... Uh, hi. Actually, I think you've already addressed it. It was really about the cumulative effect of different events, the frequency of the events, and the de decay rates. All of those things were what I was wondering about, and they've all been discussed. Okay, great. Great minds think alike. All right. Um, so, Jen, um, you're up again. Awesome. Thanks. Um, I had two kind of comments, questions. One is uh, I don't know if you've considered doing something non-parametric for the uh, event analysis, but you could do that. So then you get around the issues of model. Um, so I put in the comments, you basically, right now you have some sort of observed effect at the dates of the terrorist attacks, cr cr crime events, but then you can, you know, take all other dates and make the same calculation. And then you get this uh, distribution of estimated effects. And then you see is your effect outside of the mass of that distribution? Um, can you reject the null, no effect? And so then you don't, it's not so model dependent. Um, you could consider doing that as a robustness check of your model. It shouldn't be any different. Um, and the second question is, I guess, slightly 
broader, which is this paper seems to focus a lot on attitudes, um, but it's not exactly clear. Is this a specific attitude on anti-immigration policy? Is this something broader about support for the party? Is this some other bundle of preferences? Um, and I think I'm asking that question because in the back of my mind, there's more and more research that seems to show this disconnect between online behavior, both what you see, what you click on, what you like, what you engage with, what you post, and attitudes, um, such as polarization attitudes. Uh, and I think, I mean, personally, I think attitudes are really important, but because we have these standard survey-based measures of attitudes and you don't check it against that, it's hard. I, I'm not super convinced that what's happening is attitudes, but at the same time, I think what you're capturing is really important. It's these behavioral changes um, that seem to be leading to some downstream changes in vote. Um, and but then introducing attitudes in here and saying that actually the, what this reflects is attitudes and attitudes is what's changing people's behavior rather than there's online behavioral change, there's online expression change, and that's what leads to <laughs> vote share change. That seems a more direct story. Um, and I just wonder if introducing the kind of attitudes uh, is more complex and and will introduce more difficulties than it's helpful. Uh, let me start with the second one, and then I will let probably Jack answer the first one because he did uh, a lot of work on that uh, uh, type of analysis. Uh, no, so thanks very much. I think that is a very, very nice suggestion, and actually it is a, a problem that we are facing uh, too, right? Uh, because uh, we have this story of attitude, uh, as you can imagine, the reviewers are uh, pushing back. Uh, so we are trying to do something to show that it's an attitude change. For instance, now we have collected the, the tweets posted by the users of the different parties and trying to see whether their sentiment when they discuss Islam and immigration is decreasing over time and start trying to claim that if we observe a, a left party supporter that over time uh, uh, discuss uh, more and more negative uh, Islam and immigration that is an attitude change. But I believe that, uh, we believe that uh, I mean, uh, it's gonna be almost impossible uh, to convince uh, that it's a really attitude. Uh, so I think that, uh, yeah, uh, what you say, behavioral change or line expression probably would be very nice to have in the paper probably rather than an attitude. Uh, you were mentioning, sorry, there's a question. You were mentioning uh, that there are uh, surveys that measure attitude and uh, we didn't uh, show the correlation with these uh, uh, surveys, if I understood well. If you can point out those uh, surveys to the us, uh, that would be extremely helpful. Uh, but I believe that uh, we all, the four of us, all are struggling right now with this issue of uh, attitude. Uh, and, uh, we are debating whether we should keep that uh, in the paper or, uh, or not. Uh, believe that the story still remain if, uh, even if we don't go with, uh, with attitude. And I will let uh, uh, probably Giacomo answer the, the first question. All right, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll email you because um, there are some studies that are able to pair on platform behavior and survey um, survey data. And so they're comparing, you know, you were asking traditional like ANES type survey questions. And then we also observe their online behavior. How do those relate or not relate? So some of those might help in terms of seeing the disconnect between attitudes and online behavior. I'll send those. I'll email those. Thanks. And Giacomo, sorry to cut you off there. Please, please go. Yeah, ahead. No, no worries. So, so the first comment was about the non-parametric tests, right? Um, so this is a, this is a very interesting uh, uh, suggestion. So we thought about that uh, at some point. Um, so then uh, we didn't really go that way. Um, part of this is because um, so so the so most of the papers that we had seen uh, that uh, use that usually look at. Uh, uh, regression discontinuous in time uh, type of uh, analysis where there is just one event. Uh, and so essentially they perturb uh, the, the cutoff. Uh, um, so in our case, uh, we, we, we originally thought that since we have like 11 events, uh, um, like uh, how to specify 
the null hypothesis uh, would have been a bit tricky, but perhaps uh, we can uh, perhaps we can go back to it. Uh, okay, um, uh, Amarali, um, you you had a question earlier. Um, maybe some of it's been covered, but maybe some of it's not. If if you would like to uh, pose your question, can we uh, unmute Amarali? Hello, good morning. I'd like to thank you for this very interesting paper. I, I actually thought there was a lot of data that I could use, a lot of information to, to do further research. I thought it was great. Um, I uh, determined my question based on my kind of ethological interest rather than my, my math interest. Uh, so uh, I prefaced it with, uh, seems that standard deviations were irrelevant here. Uh, data was double entry ledger style. The focus is where data from Twitter can be used to find cause of violence. It is my thinking that overfitting data or underfitting is the focus. Uh, overfitting can help find idiosyncrasies and to reconstruct data while being um, relatively elastic from, from a behavioral perspective. Uh, while underfitting invokes the linear path for audiences. I also think that underfitting, and I didn't put this in there, but I just thought about it, was that underfitting data, especially from a, from a news perspective, if I do it over and over and over again, I might be really manipulating my audience. And so I'd be, you know, it's maybe a kind of a, an authoritarian thing to do. Um, so this, I think, is where you can find the causes maybe for maybe a next step but this where my mind was, I also think that underfitting generates deep fake narratives, uh, thereby uh, being the culprit, you know, those, those right extremist type uh, narratives that we see out there are really generated from the deep fake narratives that uh, people are getting from underfit, underfit data. Uh, do you believe, this is my question, do you believe you could find this to be true a priori now like doing through a regression analysis, or would you really need to investigate a lot further um, to, to verify what I just said? What I was thinking of well, overfitting, underfitting, I was thinking you were referring to the doc-to-back model, where we have uh, the, 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 the machine learning, then uh, uh, while you were asking your question, uh, maybe you were referring to something else. So can you please uh, specify what you mean with uh, overfitting, underfitting? Uh, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the data that you have in here, the, the sample data that's in here, um, and, you know, your results from... Amarali, the question back to you is, in what part of the analysis is, does your question about overfitting and underfitting speak to? It, it's not, it, no, this, this is, that's I, the, the reason why I brought the overfitting and underfitting up is really, if you were to, if you were to use this data, uh, say if you're a, you know, if you're working for a newspaper, um, if you, if you could use this data to determine the fit, to determine if you can do further research, further data gathering, you know, the next phase, of uh, your development of your, okay. I, I'm just keeping it simple. I, I'm thinking, I'm not thinking about your, your uh, paper is finished. So I'm not talking about overfit and underfit in your paper because that just isn't relevant inside that paper. You'd have to do another analysis. All righty. Th okay, thank you for that. Um, let's see, we've got uh, any more questions or comments uh, from the floor? I, I don't see any, so um, we're going to wrap it up here. And I, I want to thank uh, Giacomo and uh, Gaia and Felix and Francesco. Uh, I, I, see, I think he's still on. Uh, so hopefully things are still good in Italy. And it was a really interesting uh, presentation, both uh, interesting methodologically, but also the topics uh, hugely important. Really appreciate your time and, and thanks for sharing with us this really great work. So this, this is going to conclude the recorded part of the workshop. Um, we're gonna to switch to an unrecorded, more informal mode. Uh, at least some of the authors are able to stick around. So if anybody wants to pose questions that they uh, 
uh, or, or make points that they didn't make during the recorded session, that's your chance. All right, thanks very much. We really, really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback.